This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. Hundred and seventy-five years ago, Charles Darwin visited the Galapagos. He arrived at the Galapagos as a creationist, and he left the Galapagos as a creationist. He went on to develop his ideas about evolution by natural selection. He went on to develop his historical perspective. But of course, when he visited the Galapagos, he'd just come from the New World, from South America. And this hemisphere, it turns out, Darwin couldn't have known it in his time, has only been occupied for about 15,000 years. And there's an amazing part of this story, which is actually local. Right here in La Jolla, right under the Chancellor's residence in the 1970s, two human skeletons were excavated. These are the La Jolla burials. They're about 9,600 years old. Very, very important evidence. How many of you would be outraged to learn that your Chancellor Fox at UCSD tried to dispossess our university, because we're all from the same university, of these remains? How many people would be outraged by that? Not as many. I don't understand why not. How many of you would be outraged to learn that she wanted to do this due to the complaints of a small but vocal and wealthy group of creationists? How many of you would be outraged that the UC San Diego administration is preventing qualified researchers currently from studying that evidence? Yeah, I find it outrageous too. All right, that's the controversial part of my talk. What's not controversial is that when you try to study the human condition and human evolution, you need evidence. Darwin said, we're not here concerned with hopes or fears, only the truth as far as our reason allows us to discover it. I have given the evidence to the best of my ability. 1871, Darwin had almost no fossil evidence at the time. Today we know that Neanderthals went extinct around 30,000 years ago. Our own species appears in Africa at 160,000 years ago. About a half a million years ago, those Neanderthals became a separate branch or a clade. We today know that there weren't any hominids anywhere except Africa until after around two million years ago. We know that in Africa, our own branch we call Homo, evolved. Stone tools began to be used about 2.7 million years ago. There's another even earlier genus known as Australopithecus that originates around 4.3. We know that we shared a last common ancestor with chimpanzees more than 6 million years ago, and we know that this is the segment of human evolution that today's symposium is about. But we have even more more evidence from what we might think of as a planet of the apes, at least an old world of the apes. Because from Barcelona to Yunnan, from Namibia to Hungary, there's real species diversity right there in the Miocene between 8 and 18 million years ago. But we're not going to talk about those today. It'd be a great topic of a different symposium. Today we're going to talk about this part of the primate family tree, our part, hominids. Now, it being San Diego, I have the great advantage of not having to take the time to explain what each one of these primates is. You all know that. What we didn't know for a very long time is exactly what the genetic relationships were among these primates. 
And it was due, starting in the 1960s and continuing all the way up until the modern genomic sequencing, we have now learned what our relationship is. We know that today the living mammals most closely related to ourselves are the two species of chimpanzees. And they're very closely related to each other. They only split about two million years ago. Unfortunately for the apes, we don't have very good fossil records. But all of these fossils down here along our lineage and a couple off our lineage but closely related to us are placed in the family hominidae. And when I use the term hominid, this is what I mean. And most of the speakers in this symposium will use that name and that's what we mean when we say hominid. So that's our real focus. And our focus really is on the earlier part of this branch or this clade of the family tree. So we thought about, okay, who are we gonna invite for, for speakers at CARTA? Uh, who, who are you gonna invite? Well, first let's set the topic. The topic here we decided was gonna be about the hominids themselves. If we go too broadly, we'd be here all week to talk about the context, the, the environment, climate, geology, and so forth, focusing in on the hominids. So who are you gonna call? Who are you gonna invite? Well, somebody maybe who found the oldest hominid fossils. And you want people that are recognized globally for having found the earliest, you know, people that have streets named after them. For example, you would want Michel Brunet, who found the oldest hominid fossil and has a street named after him. So, okay, we've got one speaker lined up. What do we do next? Who else has a street named after him? And it turns out nobody <laughs> in paleoanthropology. So, we had to dip more deeply into the barrel. People who actually lead field research, recover and analyze fossils, people who are still finding fossils. And these people will talk about the fossils they are actively finding in places like Chad, Ethiopia, Kenya, and South Africa. I work, and some of my colleagues work, in this part of the Afar Rift of Ethiopia. It's a lowland depression formed as the Arabian Peninsula rotates away from Africa at a rate of about that much a year, about 17 millimeters, and that's fast in geological terms. So what that means is this valley has been opening up over time due to these tectonic movements. And we have all the ingredients here in these rift valleys for fossilization of previous life forms. We have the lakes, the sedimentation, the volcanics that can date them, and you'll learn more about this. We go to the field every year. It's a very remote area in the Afar of Ethiopia. This is the field team. And occasionally, we don't get out of the field before it rains. This was last February, after heavy rains. And all of the water from the highlands comes down in ponds. And when it dries up, you have a little layer of sediment right at the top, last year's flood sediment. This has been going on for millions of years. So under our feet, we have approximately a kilometer of accumulated rocks. So we're gonna look down into that kilometer to the bottom half of it in the middle Awash Valley. Beginning in 1992, Gensua, one of our speakers, found the first fossil from a horizon of 4.4 million years ago. We named it Artipithecus ramidus. It's from Aramis, Ethiopia. But what happens if you go further down in the rock record, towards six million years ago? Well, it proves to be difficult to find these older hominids. Here's a chart of all of them. We'll be talking about them today in the symposium. Starting in 1997, another of our speakers, Johannes Haile Selassie, found the first lower jaw of this thing called Ardipithecus cadaba. Shortly thereafter, in Kenya, something called Auroran was found. Andrew Hill, one of our speakers, will be talking about this. And Michel Brunet found this thing in Chad. Now, disclosure. The total combined remains from these very early rocks, late Miocene, we call them in age, can fit into two shoeboxes. When we plot out what's actually been found, older than five and a half million years ago, we have canines, incisors, premolars, and molars. So we have dentition from all of these sites. We have lower jaws from all of the sites, but only one site has yielded the face and the vault that you saw on Time Magazine. How have we done below the neck? Even more poorly. A couple of leg bones from Kenya, no matching parts from Ethiopia and Chad. 
this is really pathetic. There's not even any toe bones. Like I say, fits in a shoebox. Do all these represent the same species lineage? Well, the answer can only be ascertained at this point based on that evidence, which is limited. And when you look at the distribution of these traits, what you find is that there's not much variation there at all, certainly not as much as there is between orangutans, gorillas, chimpanzees. It's really arguable whether there's even as much difference as there is between pygmy chimps and common chimps. So answer, really too early to tell, but probably at least these things are in the same genus. Now what about these? What, what, what else can we tell about the biology from these forms? Well, do any of these fossils sample the hominid clade? Are they more closely related to us than to any other organism? Another way to ask that question, do these fossils have any characters shared uniquely with later hominids, such as Lucy? And the answer is yes, they do, especially in the canines and the premolars, the face and the vault, and in the leg. Fortunately for paleontology, the evidence gets better in younger rocks. So for example, at 1.6 million years ago, we have the Turkana boy. We have some South African skeletons. Here's Lucy from Ethiopia at 3.2 million years ago. Johannes has gone on to open his own site. He just announced this skeleton in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. And this one here at 4.4 million years ago. There's our shoe boxes over there. Sorry, that's all we can do. So we go to the best, earliest evidence, which is this skeleton. It's from the Middle Awash. It's from right here in the Middle Awash, spatially, and right there in time, 4.4 million years ago much of a skeleton. For scale, this is the landscape, and that's a vehicle. Very, very large landscape. Very, very small fossils. This is what they look like on the ground. That's about three quarters of an inch long. It's a tooth of something. It's a tooth of an antelope that's eroding out of floodplain sediments laying down 4.4 million years ago. Actually, it's a kudu. So when we go to the fossil record, we're not going to the fossil record just for the hominids, but for the entire paleobiology and geography of this place. We want to extract as much evidence as we can from this unique horizon. In order to do that, to extract the evidence and then to analyze the evidence, it takes a long time. In this particular case, we had so much evidence, it took 17 years. And finally, 47 authors from 10 countries, 11 papers published last October in science. Um, now, an interesting thing happened along the way to that. People criticized us like crazy. Why, are, why aren't you publishing faster? We need to know the information. That was true all the way up to the day that we published in science. The next day, what was the complaint? You've published too much. You see, we published about 600 pages on this primate, this Ardipithecus ramidus from 4.4 million years ago. And it's all here, and it's all available online. Well, so what, you know, what, what does it tell us? Well, it tells us amazing detail about the world at 4.4 million years ago in this place. For instance, one of the experts on that picture, one of those authors, works on birds. He's able to take a little bone from a bird and tell you it's a parrot or tell you it's a peacock. And it turns out that almost half of the birds from this place found with Ardipithecus are parrots and peacocks. That's really unusual. Most of the sites are dominated by water birds like ducks who die in water and get buried. Most of the other sites in Africa are dominated by these kinds of animals. They're antelope who eat grass in the grasslands, not by those kudus. So we can look and we can say, gee, you know, that's interesting. Look how many primates there are. In addition to the hominids, there are all kinds of monkeys. And among the monkeys, there are colobus monkeys, leaf-eating monkeys. And we can do this with one group of animals after another. Invertebrates, plants, mammals, all of these animals. We can even look at the isotopes in that dental enamel, and we can plot out the kudus. That, those are these antelope here. Here are the kudus, and this yellow one right next to it, same isotopic composition virtually is Ardipithecus. And it's in this more closed fauna, which is numerically abundant on the site relative to the more open grassland faunas. So we infer from this that the habitat preference was a grassy woodland. All right, fine. I said I wasn't going to talk much about context. It's important in this case, though. In January 1994, this man right here, Johannes, was moving very slowly across this surface when he found a hominid bone. We excavated. We started to find more in place. We removed the top of that hill, and each one of these flags is a separate part of what turned out to be 
one hominid individual's skeleton. Here's Johannes with, with a piece of the hand in Matrix. Here's a piece of the hand. This is from the palm of a primate who died here 4.4 million years ago, slowly exposed, and then removed. These bones were very fragile, very broken. But when we had them all extracted three years later, and when we had them all cleaned of matrix another five years later, we can start the analysis of the teeth, the skull, the hands, the feet, and the pelvis. And we ended up with an individual. Only one individual was represented. But at the same time, we were working in the same time horizon, and we found 115 hominid specimens of other individuals. In studying this massive material for all this time, we're able to learn that this skeleton, the new one from Ethiopia, shared a lot of characters with later skeletons like Lucy, and indeed with our own skeleton. What are these characteristics? Well, the canine teeth are very feminized, even in the male individuals. The skull is very short. The pelvis is short and broad in the upper part. And the foot is very specialized on the side of the foot. Very interesting organism. And since it's so close, to the split with the apes, it also casts some light on chimpanzees. So now we can understand, because of this fossil record, that chimpanzees have been evolving at the same time that humans have. They've evolved these long bones in the palm of their hands. They're not short like the one we dug out of the ground. They're very long. They're elongate. They're knuckle walkers. Their huge incisors are highly evolved for their frugivorous diet. They're short backs. They're flexible grasping feet, their knuckle walking, their vertical climbing, their diets, indeed their social structures are probably highly derived. All right, so we published this last October and the controversy so far has been about, did it really prefer a woodland habitat? Is it the ancestor of Australopithecus? What kind of locomotion did it use? And is it a hominid? The answer to the Context is, yes, you've seen some of the data, there's a lot more. Is it a hominid? Seems to be yes, you'll hear more about that in the symposium. Seems to be bipedal on the ground, and it may actually be the ancestor of later hominids, at least generically speaking. Let's look at why we would say these kinds of things. We take a foot of a chimpanzee. The old anatomist used to call the chimpanzees and gorillas, the apes, the great apes, quadramanus, because their feet are so much like hands. Interesting thing we found in studying this fossil from Ethiopia, imagine that you are Artipithecus and you're looking down at the top of your foot. You've got a problem when you go to the shoe store because your big toe sticks out from the side. How do we know that about this creature? Because we can look in three dimensions at that joint. This is the joint right there, and it's a hinge joint. Your toe won't do this. Nobody's toe in this room, your large toe, can't do this. It can't rotate away from the foot like Artie's can. So there's the divergent big toe. That's kind of ape-like. But the rest of the foot is not ape-like at all. In chimpanzees, they have very flexible midfeet, and they allow versatile grasping of a variety of substrates. Here we see chimps grasping with their feet on these substrates. In Artipithecus, very different. Their phalanges and these bones here, the metatarsals, are very similar to later hominids, like the Lucy hominid. And they differ from modern apes in a rigid midfoot, and the lateral foot is functioning as a lever. Nobody's ever seen a primate like this before. The only way we can see it is to get the historical evidence, extract it from the record, and analyze it. You cannot discover this looking at living chimps or looking at molecules of living chimps or living humans. You can only get these data from the paleontological record. The pelvis gave a similar interesting story. This is the pelvis, it doesn't look like much. When you dig it out of the ground, you extract it in a plaster jacket because the thing's almost ready to fall apart. You clean it up, you clean it up more. It took a long time to clean this up. Then you have important Australopithecus-like features of the ilium that aren't, re aren't really reliant on this reconstruction. We can look at the bone itself. This is continuous bone across that surface. It's a very broad upper pelvis very Australopithecus-like. But look at how far it projects down below Lucy in the back. This is the part of the bone you sit on, much more like a climbing chimpanzee. This is a mosaic organism. We have lots of pieces of it and other individuals. We have a lot of contexts. And so what that means is that we have new insights into relationships. 
In the old days when the Lucy species was found in the 1970s, we were going with a kind of a bad model. Afarensis, the, the fossils in the middle, we compared to humans and chimps. In the 1970s, we were impressed by how primitive Lucy and her colleagues were compared to later hominids. In 2010, we're impressed by how evolved Afarensis is compared to earlier hominids like Artie. Which brings us back to Darwin. When Darwin thought about this issue, Darwin didn't say we evolved from chimpanzees. Darwin actually said, be careful here. We must not fall into the error of supposing the early progenitor of the whole simian stock, including humans, was identical with or even closely resembled any existing ape or monkey. He said that in 1871 with no fossil evidence. It was a clear warning that was ignored by generations of anthropologists who expected that we would find chimpanzees the further back we went into the fossil record. But it's hard because the further you go back in the fossil record, the harder it is to recover paleobiological data. This subject is all about evidence. All of this evidence, all of the colored windows are evidence from Kenya, from Ethiopia, from Tanzania, of completely new creatures that have been found since 1990. Today, in this symposium, we have the people who found these fossils, who analyzed these fossils. Every one of these single patches is represented by somebody here today who's going to discuss the fossils with us. But look at the thing. There are still mostly gaps. It's mostly not evidence. It's mostly gaps. Can we fill the gaps? Well, when you ask that question, can we fill the gaps, it, it reminds us of this guy, Dirty Harry, who said in 1971, you've got to ask yourself one question. Do I feel lucky? Well, do you? Well, back in, 19, in 2003, we felt lucky, and we got a lot of money from the National Science Foundation. We spent it before last year. Lots of those apes all over Europe, all the way over into China were found. A lot of things here in Africa, younger hominids, but the early hominids, very, very difficult to find. You can read more about that at the website, rhoi.berkeley.edu. And here's what I think is going on. If we think of extant apes today with geographic range, they also have a very tight range of habitat preference. The last common ancestor had a wider range of preferred habitats, already a little wider, Australopithecus wider, early Homo expanding with technology, and finally we have Homo sapiens. This niche expansion has been brought about by our evolving anatomy and technology in an interface, and there are a couple of pieces of bad news about this. One, it's really bad news if you're an extant ape because your habitats have been encroached upon and you're near extinction. And the other bad news is if you're a paleontologist because the things that we're looking for down here with this last common ancestor is very restricted in geographic range. So when we go to a big site like the Middle Awash, we can find Australopithecus above and Artipithecus below, but to bridge that gap right in there, we find our outcrop is a lake, and there are lots of fish, but no primates. And still we go back to the field every year, and we hope to find something. Here excavating a wonderful elephant mandible 5.2 million years ago. Here's another excavation. What the hell's going on here? Are they starting from the top and digging down? And the answer is no, we're taking down a National Science Foundation sponsored laboratory that served as a repository of these fossils until about five years ago when the Ethiopian government began to build a gigantic new facility in Addis Ababa. This is the paleoanthropology wing. It opened this spring. These are the fossils moving into that facility. Elephants, rodents, birds, all those fossils, including the hominids. This is the Ethiopian Minister of Culture and the Japanese ambassador to Ethiopia who donated wonderful new materials, Gansua, who's here today, instrumental in this, in the creation of a facility. And so I'm gonna close this talk, not by looking to the past, but by thinking about the future. One of the points I wanna make is, the things that you're gonna hear about today are not here because of luck. Only the last little bit is luck. The rest of it's hard work. And these are the people who have done the hard work to generate these fossils. And the other thing I want to close with is that education, evidence, rationality, and science is what's going to take us 
into the future.